Okay, so good morning to everyone. And uh, I'm really happy and honored this morning to introduce Michelle. Michelle is a great friend of us, and she worked a lot within our LASI group. She studied in the um, California State University, and then she worked in the USGS. She worked for more than 25 years as leading the land subsidence research group in the California Water Security Service Center. And then she's now changed a bit the role and she moved to another, another uh, institution again in, in, the, in the USGS. And she has worked and published a lot about land subsidence in California and in other uh, Western region on the US. From my point of view, I can say she's quite happy. She's a, she worked in a sort of dream for our scientists work, working on land subsidence, right? 10 meters of subsidence. I work on two millimeter of subsidence. So you it's much better to, to stay in that place from our point of view, but it's, of course, she, she do a little, very good job. And I think we will have a very nice presentation. From my point of view, Michelle is able to make simple and understandable complex issue to everyone. She has really a good job on this. So it's really a pleasure to, to have Michelle here, Michelle. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction, uh, Pietro. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about, it's really my, my favorite story um, in land subsidence. Uh, it started long before uh, I was born um, with this man here, Joe Poland, right? Everybody has seen this picture for a very long time um, using a telephone pole to illustrate the land subsidence that uh, had occurred in the San Joaquin Valley between 1925 and 1977, which is about nine meters. Um, and uh, he was a pioneer, and I feel like I am just, you know, standing on his shoulders. So before I um, introduce you to the story of the San Joaquin Valley, I just wanted to introduce um, the United States and where Subsidence occurs um, or has occurred uh, in the United States. And you, you would notice uh, kind of three areas, you know, in the West here, there's a lot of dots. Um, and these are just locations where land subsidence has been documented. You also see um, a lot in the Gulf Coast here and some on the East Coast. And, um, you know, while I'm going to, you know, talk to you about this area that subsides at a third of a meter per year, um, you know, I also want to drive home the point that uh, it doesn't always matter how much subsidence that you have. It really matters where it occurs. Um, a few millimeters of subsidence in the San Joaquin Valley, no big deal. A few millimeters of subsidence on the coast, it's a big deal. Um, so uh, the San Joaquin Valley is located in the central part of California. I live just north of here. Uh, just north of the San Joaquin Valley, right about there, kind of near San Francisco. Uh, so it's, uh, it's close to home. I'm a, I'm a native Californian. I was raised there. Uh, and so it's, it's near and dear to my heart um, that I got to work in this area. Uh, it's, it was always, you know, Pietro mentioned a dream. Uh, I always wanted to work in the San Joaquin Valley because of Joe Poland, because of all of this history. So much happened there, so much innovation uh, from that group. So it was really fun um, after we're about I guess, 15 years or so of working in land subsidence studies to finally get a project in the San Joaquin Valley. So to talk about land subsidence in California, we really have to talk about water availability and how it's distributed in California. And it's, it's really not a terribly different story than China. We've built huge canals um, to move water because most of it falls in Northern California, up here. Um, but most of the people, right, Los Angeles, San Diego, a lot of people down there, 
and lots and lots of farms here in the San Joaquin Valley. <clears throat> so, um, so it's these canals that I'm going to focus on a lot um, because they're very sensitive uh, to subsidence. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. The Central Valley is, is hugely important to California, to the nation, to the world for food. Um, and I have a slide a little bit later on with a few statistics about that. Uh, we produce a, a lot of food, a huge variety of food uh, in California. And we use uh, a combination of groundwater and surface water. Uh, but of course, during droughts, which we have many, and I'll talk to you about those, um, we use more groundwater. And you know, as it's turning out, uh, you know, in the last 13 years, it's been more drought than not. Uh, this year is an exception. Uh, California had an, uh, an exceptional winter, um, but of course now that's causing, causing flooding problems. So California never does anything down the middle, extremes only. That's, that's all we do anymore. So uh, the process of uh, land subsidence in California is a result of aquifer system compaction, right? And so um, it's uh, you know unconsolidated to semi-consolidated assemblage of sands and silts and clays, and and it's those fine grain materials, those clays, where all the action happens. Um, you know, where uh, in this first uh, panel here. You know, water levels are pretty high. As water levels decline year after year, with some seasonal effect, uh, we get some compaction of the aquifer system. As water levels decline to lower and lower water levels, it's inelastic compaction. And a consequence of that is a loss of storage capacity. So when I explain this to, to people that don't really understand aquifer system compaction, I tell them that Imagine that you've had a dinner party and you have a bunch of uh, dinner plates and you don't want to do dishes yet, so you just you throw them all uh, in the sink. And they're haphazard, right? They're in different orientations uh, and there's a lot of space, right? So there's a lot of space between those grains and that's where water is stored. But once you have inelastic compaction, uh, then it's more like plates that you put in your cupboard, right? Stacked on top of each other. There's a lot less space between the grains um, and that never comes back. So, um, you know, as I'll talk about um, uh, towards the end of the talk, you know, we're starting to use aquifer systems as managed reservoirs in California. We have numerous super, uh, surface reservoirs, something like, uh, th like thousands, two or three thousand reservoirs in California. We've already built them in all of the best places. It's not that we couldn't raise them a few feet, but that's extremely expensive and only gets you a little bit more storage. So aquifer systems um, are starting to be used as managed reservoirs, and we're impacting their ability to store water. Right? These poor spaces are much smaller, uh, and we can never get them back. So in the previous slide, right, we have to have two things for aquifer system compaction to occur. We need clay, and we need groundwater level declines. We have both of these things in the San Joaquin Valley. So in the, uh, the upper graph, and I'll show you the aquifer system in a minute, where the, we have a shallow well and a deep well. So we have a kind of semi-confined system uh, in the shallow. And then we have a, a aqu aquitard, a very thick aquitard. And then we have a deeper system. And as you might be able to tell here, most of the um, withdrawal is from the deeper system. You can see that the shallow well, um, relatively stable. You can see the seasonal effects. So in California, we get no rain in the summer. Um, and if we happen to get lucky enough that year to get rain, it happens in the winter. So we have a very strong seasonal signal uh, where we pump a lot of groundwater uh, in the summer um, when the rivers start to, to, to get a little bit drier. Um, and, the, and the reason we pump from the deeper system is because it's better water quality. So the upper system doesn't have as good as water quality, uh, so we like to pump from the deeper system. 
and we get to historical lows. Uh, and you, you could, I, I outlined the droughts here, but if I didn't, you could tell, right, when the droughts were. You could see, you know, water levels decline and then rebound and then decline, right, rebound, a little wet, really dry. So we've been in a dry, uh, we've been in a dry spell the last few years. Um, this winter essentially broke that, um, but of course now we're having flooding problems. We also have a lot of clay uh, in the San Joaquin Valley. So this, this picture is a little bit weird to look at, but what it represents is uh, lithology in boreholes. So these are kind of boreholes from wells, right, hung in space, color-coded for what we encountered along the way. And you can see that there's a lot of blue, right? So a lot of, of clay. So we have the conditions for aquifer system compaction in the San Joaquin Valley. So here's what the aquifer system looks like. Uh, so this is a cross section here, California. And so this is the coast ranges, um, sort of near the Pacific Ocean, uh, the Sierra Nevada, where much of our uh, water storage occurs. So snowpack is extremely important in California. It's our biggest reservoir. Um, we uh, have grown to rely on it, which of course is a problem with a warming climate. Um, this year being a, a great exception, uh, we've had you know, very dry winters where there's not a lot of snowpack. And so you know, we count on that snowpack to melt slowly, come down the rivers during the summer when we need it. Um, and, and a lot of years we don't have that. So we have a, um, an unconfined system. It's unconfined, but it's really semi-confined because there's a lot of clay. So it's kind of the deeper you go uh, down, the more confined it becomes because you encounter more clay. Uh, and then we have what's called this Corcoran clay system. And uh, Matt Lees talked about this quite a bit yesterday. And we have a confined system. And although the Corcoran clay confines the lower system, uh, we have hundreds of thousands of wells in the San Joaquin Valley, which are screened throughout the aquifer system. So there's a lot of sort of cross uh, communication between the aquifers. Um, a lot of, uh, uh, we have tons of clay, something like much of the valley is um, about 60% clay or so. So a lot, a lot of clay to cause that compaction. So subsidence monitoring the San Joaquin Valley is extremely important. Uh, first of all, it can result right, in early detection, finding small problems before they become big problems. Um, we haven't been really good at this. Uh, we're getting better at it. And I'll show you a, a historical perspective in a minute. Um, but it also provides some uh, measure of water resource sustainability within you know, planning horizons of water agencies. Um, there's not, you know, one central agency in California that controls all the water. Uh, it's many different agencies, uh, and it's, it's a very complicated system. Uh, and it's really needed for subsidence management, if that's an objective of a particular uh, water agency. So here I just show um, some of the, you know, we, we have a lot of monitoring in the San Joaquin Valley uh, today. Uh, we had a lot historically, but there was a large gap in the middle that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, this is a uh, continuous GPS leveling. We don't do too much anymore. It's expensive and the valley is huge. Um, and so we don't do too much of that. Uh, we do a lot of INSAR and um, my favorite extensometers. Those are, those are my favorite method of monitoring. So uh, there is a long subsidence history in, in uh, the San Joaquin Valley, as I mentioned, which was why it was so fun to um, get back in there and start monitoring and, and uh, checking out what's going on. So on the left side here, you see this map of historical land subsidence. So this is 1926 to 1970, which is barely before I was born. And you can see that it's concentrated on the west side of the valley. Well, at this location here where this arrow is coming from, we, have, uh, we had an extensometer and water levels that we measured. Um, and you can see that you know, water levels were declining 
and then all of a sudden they came, they came up. And the reason they came up was because that's when this California aqueduct was built and started to deliver surface water to the valley. And so that essentially got farmers off of groundwater and groundwater levels recovered. You could see compaction here diminished. Um, and then you could see during a drought, water levels crashed again. And we had subsidence reinitiate, compaction reinitiate. But it was only a year drought. It was a horrible, really, really dry year. Only a one year uh, uh, drought caused an enormous water level decline. Right? And by the way, that's a consequence of the loss of storage capacity. When there's less storage capacity, water levels are going to increase and decrease much faster than they did before. After this drought in 76 to 77, you see groundwater levels increase again until the next drought, uh, which was 86 to 92. And then you can see recovery again, right? So it, it kind of looks like uh, the California aqueduct delivering surface water kind of fixed the problem, uh, except, except during droughts, right? But, um, you know, droughts aren't, weren't that common, and so that seemed like that worked. Well, it was drought that brought us back into the valley again to start doing some additional research. Uh, and that drought was in um, 2007 to 2009. And I'll show you a few uh, maps here in a minute. And these red circles represent where we see subsidence now. So it's different. It's not in the same place as it was before. People always say, oh, you should go back and do the Joe Poland photo in the same spot. Well, he did that uh, right about here. And there's just not a lot of subsidence happening there. And so it would be uh, the picture would kind of have the opposite effect than you want. You know, it would look like everything was okay. Um, so this is where we have subsidence now. This is uh, um, interferometry. It's, um, it's put out by the California Department of Water Resources, uh, who have um, contracted with uh, Trey Altamira to put this data together. And it's updated every so often. So this is uh, 2015 to 2022. And uh, you know, here you can see uh, you know, in seven years, um, you know, in many places, we have uh, pretty severe subsidence. I'll show you time series here in a few minutes so you have an idea of how that, how that happens. Um, so as I mentioned, the the um, San Joaquin Valley and really the Central Valley as a whole is really important for food production in California. Um, you know, I have some statistics here, I won't read them. But what I find really amazing is that for 1% of the farmland in all of the United States, we pump 20% of the groundwater for all the United States. Uh, so an enormous amount of water is pumped in this valley. And so when we came back uh, in about 2009, 2010 to start looking at what's been happening, because you know what happens when you think a problem is fixed, you stop looking at it. Um, and so there was a long period of time when nobody looked at subsidence. Um, nobody was monitoring it, uh, didn't have an idea what was going on. But um, operators of canals started to get kind of nervous uh, when the 2000, uh, seven to nine drought occurred. And they, they called us in and they said, you know, we want to see what's going on. And so we didn't have any instruments in place because those resources went elsewhere to solve other problems. Uh, and um, so we started to look at continuous GPS data. We looked at some groundwater level data. And from this graph, you might think, wow, it looks like we have the same situation as we did before. It looks like everything's OK except for during droughts. But of course, now you see droughts are occurring more often than they were. Um, and, um, and so we thought, OK, well, we'll set up some monitoring and see what's going on. Um, we uh, did get some other data. So this is in one part. This is um, not too far from where Joe Poland took that picture. Well. Uh, you start to look at other data in the area, right? So this tells you, oh, it's only a problem during droughts. But it's not only a problem during droughts. 
Um, we are mining the groundwater in the San Joaquin Valley. As you see here, it doesn't matter if it's a drought year or not a drought year, um, we are still subsiding and groundwater levels are persistently lowering. So this is what recent subsidence looks like. This is a little bit outdated. Um, uh, it's uh, 2008 to 2010, but it's the same pattern that we see today. And this is the historical, right? So a little bit different location than it was before. So I'm going to show you data from this location. Uh, this is uh, the first extensometer that Joe Poland uh, built. It started to collect data in 1958. Um, there was leveling data before that. And we were lucky enough to go in and be able to refurbish this extensometer and get some uh, new data out of it. As a result, we have a very, very long record. Um, we're coming up on a, a century of data in one location, which is pretty cool to think about. Um, uh, so we've had mashed together several types of data here, starting with leveling data, uh, and then uh, you could see where the uh, extensometer data right comes in. Um, but of course, you know, the uh, declines were already well on their way. And as I mentioned before, right, groundwater levels recovered when the California aqueduct started to deliver surface water. And so that groundwater um, pumping was reduced during those times, uh, except for during droughts. And you see dramatic water level declines during droughts and subsidence. You know, you can see these sort of, uh, you know, ticks, right? Sort of ticks down and then kind of flattens out and then goes down again and flattens out. Um, and this is the, the one site that we have the smallest data gap for. Um, it's about 10 years. Uh, we don't know what happened during those 10 years. And then you can see, uh, you know, when we got this thing back online um, and we, we had to um, essentially completely redo it. Uh, we, you know, I was kind of like, wow, well, we just missed the last drought. You know, that's kind of a bummer. I had no idea that we we're about to come into a major drought that would change um, how water is distributed in California um, forever. Um, it ended up, um, you know, it's don't let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, and so California during this drought um, decided that they needed to have groundwater laws. There was absolutely no control on groundwater before uh, 2014. If you drilled a well, you could pump as much as you wanted, as long as it wasn't wasted, which was, you know, the, the language was so loose uh, that you could essentially do, you know, you could wash cars with it, you could do whatever you want with it. Um, and uh, so this, this uh, drought really changed things um, forever in California. And then you can see we kind of had a flattening out, and then we've had droughts the last few years. Um, getting to historical low levels again. So a few time series to show you kind of how, um, how it's been looking. So we're going to look at um, sort of this area that we call uh, El Nido. It's a small town. This is all, you know, farming community. So, um, you know, the, the urban areas are, are really quite small, uh, except for uh, maybe Fresno in here. That's a pretty big uh, city. Uh, but the rest of the cities here are pretty small. Uh, and they're really just farming communities. So what these graphs tell me is that you can, you can almost use the graphs to know who has access to surface water and who does not have access to surface water. Um, right? So this, this graph you've seen before, right? this is the first one we looked at and we thought, oh, okay, it looks like it's the same situation as historically where um, Subsidence is kind of solved, except during droughts, right? Well, that's because they have access to surface water, right? So when there is water available, they use it and they get off the pumps. There's other parts of the valley, right? This just this is just heading south, you know, just getting faster and faster. Rate increases during drought, um, but it's always subsiding. Uh, same thing up here, and these are these are very close together. These are you know, tens of, uh, uh, of kilometers. Uh, and then I circled the, I had to circle the, uh, the um, scale on that particular continuous GPS site because it's subsiding so much faster than the rest. 
Uh, and so it's a different scale um, than the others on this graph that I wanted to point out. Um, definitely no surface to, or no access to surface water there. So we also have a network of extensometers, and um, and I'm really excited uh, to um, to get this extensometer up and running, these, this network up and running, and uh, it looks like we're going to get to expand it even more, um, working with our uh, our colleague uh, Kelvin Hung to build magnetic extensometers, uh, which will really, really be important uh, for California because the difference between the extensometers that we have now is that they, they just measure one interval per borehole. And these things range anywhere from um, uh, about oh, 150 meters to um, about 400 meters, I think, is one of the deeper ones. Uh, and you get one interval, right? So that's helpful, but if you're going to try to, you know, maximize your withdrawal and minimize your pumping, you really need to know where the compaction is coming from, you know, not just somewhere between land surface, you know, and 400 meters. You need more exact information, and so we're really excited. Uh, it looks like that's going to happen. You never know, but it's looking pretty promising, uh, and we've been talking about it for 10 years, so... I'm, I'm thrilled. I have a thing for extensometers, if you couldn't tell. Uh, <laughs> so um, Oraloma, again, this is the, the site that I showed you before with the 87 years of data. Um, one of the older sites that was built by Joe Pollan. And uh, you could, this is uh, the, the record that we've had since we got it back online. And you could see, uh, you could point out the droughts. I didn't, I didn't uh, put them on here, but you could point out when the droughts are based on the extensometer and the water level data. We have a few more, um, and they look essentially the same. Um, and they're not all that far apart. Um, and here you can see, you know, uh, you know, 414 meters, not all that different than what is shown at 305 meters. Uh, these two are a little bit different. So these, these two extensometers are anchored in the top of the corker and clay. And this becomes really, uh, it provides good information uh, when combined with continuous GPS, which I'll show you in just a minute. Uh, but you can see here, these are very close together, uh, pretty much show um, the same pattern. And, and by the way, these all have sort of different, you know, start points, right? So this one's uh, 1958, this one's, I think, 1964, uh, and these are since um, 2000 and... 1999, so something like that. So going to the to the southern area of Pixley, and so Pixley also has a special place in my heart because Joe Pullen did so much work at Pixley, uh, did a lot of experiments trying to figure out, you know, what was causing the subsidence, um, because you know he was called out when they were building this Delta Mendota Canal here. So there's several canals, but this is the Delta Mendota Canal was built first. And they started to do repeated leveling surveys, and you know they weren't matching up, and uh, so they called in, you know, geologists to ask what what is going on. And this is, you know, this is how Joe Poland sort of figured things out. Did a lot of experiments out here, and by the way, it was kind of cool that, you know, it's it's kind of rare that the U.S. government actually learns uh, something and and applies it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but they did. So what they said was, because uh, the Delta Mendota was, Canal was built before the California Aqueduct, and they said, hey, you know what? There's a lot of problems where the, the uh, Delta Mendota Canal comes out into the valley, so keep the California Aqueduct up against the mountains. Uh, and that turned out to be a pretty smart decision. Not that the California Aqueduct isn't impacted, but it would have been much worse had it been more in the center of the valley where the aquifer system is thicker and there's more subsidence. Okay, so we'll look at a few uh, time series down here. Kind of a similar story um, to, to the El Nido area where uh, you know some areas you see subsidence only during drought, right? There's really just one of them. <laughs> Uh, they have access to surface water. There's a Friant Kern Canal. This is a federally owned canal here. Um, and uh, so they get some access to that surface water when it's available. 
Um, um, this one also, right, uh, looks pretty good. Um, and there's still some subsidence occurring during drought, but not too much. So they, they have access to surface water uh, where the other areas do not. So next densometers down here too, uh, and uh, a variety of depths, and they show you know, a similar situation. If you have noticed, you know, all of our monitoring stations are all on the edges of these bowls, right? They're all on the edges. We don't have any information in the center of these things uh, because the location changed, right? If subsidence was happening in the same location as it did historically, uh, our monitoring stations would be perfectly placed. Uh, but of course, they're, they're not. They're all on the edges. Uh, and so we just get a little glimpse of what's happening uh, in the very worst parts of the valley. Um, so similar situation. Uh, these two look very similar. Um, uh, different, um, different magnitudes, but very similar pattern. And this is our newest station here, um, the, the uh, Porterville site. Uh, we just refurbished that in uh, 2018. And so interestingly enough, uh, as I'll get to, so this, this canal has a lot of problems. Um, and so they are building a second canal and they did a cost assessment and decided that, because they didn't want to mess up our extensometer, it's important data for them, they decided that they would leave the extensometer and route the canal around the extensometer. <laughs> They're so expensive. <laughs> um, so the occurrence of land subsidence. This is a, you know, a, a, a geological phenomenon. What we see, so this is from the uh, Central Valley Hydrologic Model, and uh, this is just the, the, upper, uh, the upper layer of the model, but it's indicative of what we see as we go through the, through the depth of the valley, where we have um, two areas in particular that are more fine-grained, and it's where we're seeing the most subsidence. And the reason for that is because, so the Sierra Nevada was a glaciated mountain range. Well, those two areas were not directly connected to the glaciation, which means they didn't have those big pulses of coarse grain materials that came down through those valleys. So the result is they're much finer grained than the uh, fans uh, north or south of them. So as I mentioned, uh, when you have um, you know, extensometers and continuous GPS, near each other, which we have in this situation, this can be you know, very helpful to figure out, to at least divide up a little bit you know, what, um, what compaction is happening in different parts of the system. You know, as I mentioned, borehole extensometers, the ones that we have right now measure one interval. Um, and so, uh, so here's a little graphic showing. Uh, these, this extensometer is anchored in the top of the Corcoran clay. Right? GPS goes to the center of the Earth, right? And so you compare these two data sets, and clearly, you know, there's much less happening uh, in the upper system, right, than the lower system. Um, further uh, modeling, 1D modeling, and Matt Lees talked about this yesterday. We found the same thing with our, our 1D modeling, uh, that it's not just occurring below the top of the Corcoran clay, but it's actually occurring below the bottom of the Corcoran clay. Um, almost all of the compaction, something like, 91% uh, of the compaction is occurring in the deep system, only about 3% in the Corcoran clay, and about 6% in the upper system. And, um, and the Corcoran clay, um, we've drilled through it, and you know, you'd think it's this massive clay. Well, it's really uh, quite dry and hard. And you know, while it's, it's really slow compacting, uh, it's not our biggest problem right now. You know, in a few hundred years, we might shake our fist at it, and because uh, it's still going to be slowly draining and compacting residually for a very long time. It's very tight, very tight system. Okay, so I want to talk about some of the impacts because uh, this is really where where it matters, right? So, so data is data, but until it really affects us people or things, uh, nobody really cares about it. Uh, so I'm going to sort of talk about. Uh, the impacts in two categories, uh, direct and indirect, and I'll go through them relatively quick, but infrastructure damage is the biggie. Um, our canals are gravity-driven, 
And so um, every point upstream has to be higher than every point downstream for flow to work. Uh, as soon as you uh, differentially subside, right? So you saw the maps, it's not subsiding the same everywhere. Um, now you have a problem with gravity flow. You have to fill that up. You may have to make the canal deeper. You may have to raise infrastructure. Um, I already showed and talked about the reduced aquifer system storage capacity, which is becoming much more important as we're using aquifer systems as managed reservoirs. And then there's indirect flooding, which is happening as I speak, um, and also some environmental impacts are indirect. Um, and, uh, and I'll explain this picture a little bit better here in a minute. And this is just, you know, sort of a classic protruding well. Uh, right, so, so the problem with um, differential subsidence on gravity-driven canals is that you get a reduced conveyance capacity. You can't move as much water as you used to move um, through the canal. Um, they call them, often they call them pinch points, uh, where it's reduced capacity. Um, you get panel damage. So we uh, line many of our canals with, with concrete lining. So that concrete can break, and now you may have water coming in behind the levee, right? Eroding the levee, uh, damaging the integrity uh, of that levee. Um, and also can get water surface and liner misalignment, right? So the water may, may overtop uh, those liners. But really anything with, you know, lo any long infrastructure, and, and Matt said that yesterday as well, uh, it, you know, roads, railways, bridges, pipelines, anything that's rigid, that isn't flexible, that goes over these long distances, uh, will eventually uh, rupture. And uh, here's an a image of a, you know, these used to be connected. <laughs> so, uh, well isn't very useful anymore. Um, tons of, uh, you know, water conveyance uh, and transportation infrastructure through these areas. So this is a, a high-speed rail proposed. It's not built yet. Um, part of it's being built further in the south. Um, but you can see, you know, I, I almost said, you know, because we, we shared this data and it's, we were like, no, red is bad. Don't, don't put it through the red part, you know, but they, that's what they did. Um, <laughs> um, this is the east side bypass. This is a very important flood control channel. Um, it's, so the San Joaquin Valley is a closed basin. So, and we have all of that snowpack just waiting to come down. And there's nowhere, it has to go out through the San Francisco Golden Gate. There's no other place for it to go out. And so to ease flooding on the San Joaquin River, uh, they built this east side bypass uh, to try to ease that flooding. Um, major roads go through this. And by the way, these are just federal and state canals. There are thousands of local canals. And you know, state and federal pockets are deep. Right? They can fix their canals. They can mitigate. It's the local agencies, the local people that really get harmed in this because they don't have the resources to fix their canals. So here's just a couple of examples of water conveyance. So in this uh, uh, images on the left, they had to build up the infrastructure um, to keep up with the subsidence. So this is kind of a double-decker structure now. They had to add these gates on. On the right, this is a road that crosses a canal. You know, if you're on a bridge and you look over the bridge, you expect to see water flowing under whatever structure you're on. You can see there's nothing here. There's no space. It's running into the bridge. So there's no freeboard. People used to kayak under these things. Uh, and now there's nothing left. Uh, so they had to build up these walls to try to keep the road dry. It's uh, marginally successful. Uh, apparently, this road is supposed to be, this bridge is supposed to be replaced. But I've heard that, I think, for 10 years now, so I don't, I don't know what's going on with that. Um, so I wanted to make the point, you know, again, that it doesn't necessarily matter how much subsidence you have, but where it occurs. So I'm showing you an area that is largely out of the contours of subsidence here. This is an area where when we had a drought, um, they were given five days to move water down these infrastructures to fill up this very important reservoir for agriculture. Um, a very small amount of subsidence that's occurring in that area, this is not the maximum, right? It's nice, it's up against the mountains. Uh, 
just that small amount of subsidence uh, impacted their ability to fill that reservoir because it wasn't a volume of water that they were permitted. It was an amount of time. And so a very small amount of subsidence impacted their ability to refill that reservoir as much as they could have otherwise. This is, an, this is the example I talked about earlier, the Friant Kern Canal, 60% of uh, the design capacity for conveyance has been lost, 60%. They could only move 40% of the water that that canal was designed to move. Um, they, they estimated at 500 million. Uh, I would be willing to take bets. We can talk about it later. It's going to be at least double that by the time they're done. And they're building a second canal parallel to the first, again, routing around our extensometer that I hope lasts. It doesn't have slip joints. The casing could crush any time. Uh, it would be kind of heartbreaking that they went around it for an extensometer that's broken. Uh, this is the east side bypass that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so water flows from A prime to A. So it's going up north to get out of the Golden Gate. You could see uh, that it has a big hole in it now that has to be um, filled up, which means it's probably going to overtop the sides. Uh, and that's being tested now, just over the last couple of weeks. Hasn't been tested for quite some time. We'll see how it performs. Doesn't look good so far. Right, well protrusion, right? So we get crushed well casings. Um, uh, these are protruding wells. This is an image of a crushed uh, well casing from uh, Jim Borchers. Um, and, uh, and this is in an active uh, vineyard here. And when they drilled the well, they painted the top of it orange so that the machinery, the machines wouldn't hit it. Uh, but within two years, it had uh, protruded uh, two-thirds of a meter, and so they just keep cutting it off um, so they don't run into it. It's a very deep well. This is an oil exploratory well. I already mentioned, I won't go through this again, right? Lost aquifer system storage capacity, um, particularly important as we move forward uh, with using them as, as managed reservoirs. So this is, this is what's happening right now. Right now. All that snowpack, something like 300% of normal snow, of normal snowpack, which I don't know, I don't even know what normal is anymore, but it's something like uh, 55 feet of snow are in the mountains, <laughs> and they're coming down now. It's warming up. It's springtime, um, and so this is something that's being realized right now, um, right? As and we don't even know where the floodplain is. Subsidence is happening so rapidly. Um, at a, th you know, a third of a, a meter per year, differentially, that the floodplain is changing constantly. There hasn't been work done. I tell them, I'm like, you get a plane out there and start taking pictures to map the floodplain because it's really easy to see now, right? Um, so the frequency, depth, duration of floods, right, as the landscape lowers, uh, will be impacted. I won't talk too much about ground failures because that's not really a problem uh, in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, there's been one reported. I think uh, Matt Lees mentioned that yesterday as well. It's called the Poso Creek uh, Fault, and that was activated and, and was a fissure. But it isn't really a problem. Um, the sediments, it's such a deep basin uh, that, uh, and there's no bedrock highs, um, that we just haven't seen that as a problem yet. But we have a lot of wetlands. So California is part of the Pacific Flyway, very important route for birds. Um, and you know we're seeing you know you know stream gradients. They're altering. Uh, wetlands are disappearing, reemerging in new locations. Um, and so this is a, this is a problem for natural resources. So the economic impact it really is not well known, right? There's so many indirect costs, it's very difficult to get at the economic impact of subsidence. But I'm really happy that this conversation is starting in this community. Um, uh, I, there's been several inquiries that I've gotten in the last couple of years where people are starting to try to chip away at what the economic impact is, which is really important for our research, right? Because we have to find funding to do these kinds of things. And you, they say, well, why should we care we say, oh, it's expensive. They say, how expensive is it? We have no idea, you know? So it's, it's, uh, it's difficult um, to, to get at those costs. But I'm really happy that that's starting to be a bigger conversation in our community, and we're getting economists involved. 
So what can we do about it, right? Well, as from a scientific point of view, it's really easy. I'll just stop lowering groundwater levels, right? <laughs> really easy. Uh, you know, through some combination of, you know, reduction of groundwater withdrawal uh, and increased recharge, maybe managed aquifer recharge, right? Um, so it's really easy for us to say, this is very difficult for managers uh, to implement. But as I mentioned, we didn't let a good crisis go to waste. Our big drought in uh, between 2012 and 2016 actually generated a law in California to start getting groundwater withdrawal uh, under control and to start using it sustainably. It's called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and it defines sustainable groundwater use uh, as the management and use of groundwater in a manner that can be maintained during the planning and implementation horizon without causing undesirable results. Um, you could see that um, this law applies mostly or really uh, most critically to these uh, overdrafted basins. You can see San Joaquin Valley is essentially all overdrafted. Um, um, but uh, some of these high and medium basins, they also have to do some work, um, but not quite as much as the, the critically overdrafted. So it's kind of a tiered uh, approach uh, in the law. So what's an undesirable result? So th it's a pretty cool way that they uh, have written this law. They've given the power to the locals and, and they said, you figure it out. You know, you figure out how you can use groundwater sustainably, but you can't do these things, right? Use it, do it however you want, but you can't cause these things. And to have land subsidence written into the law, it's just amazing. I mean, it's, a, it's really, truly amazing that that was part of the law, um, that land subsidence is one of those things that um, is, is a metric to be used, and um, it just can't interfere with surface land uses, right? So there's still, right, it's very squishy. So depending where you are, right, uh, you may be able to have a foot of land subsidence and it doesn't interfere with uh, surface uses, or you could have a few millimeters and it could interfere with surface uses, right? So it's a pretty squishy, uh, squishy law. And I think at first, the locals were really pretty thrilled that the government wasn't coming in and saying, do this. But then I th they got their arms, started to get their arms around the problem. And I, it's so big. It's such a big issue that now I think they're a little, um, they're a little panicked. It's, this is a difficult thing. And you know what's going to work in one area is not going to work in another area. And everybody has to get buy-in. <laughs> And so everybody has to have a seat at the table uh, that are water users. Uh, and the state has to approve their plan. Um, and many of them have been rejected, saying, no, this isn't good enough. Go back and do it again. So what is California's water future? Well, we need to increase our storage. We have so many reservoirs, uh, but we use, we use so much water. Um, that we really need to increase water storage and building new reservoirs just really, you know, we might build a couple more, but we're pretty maxed out in terms of surface reservoirs. So using aquifer systems is really uh, the way to go. And it's pretty cool. There's a lot of work being done, uh, especially by uh, UC Davis, where, you know, farmers are desperate. They, wa they, they want to continue farming. Uh, and so they're saying, okay, you can use my land to flood, right? You can see this is an active area. When we have these big atmospheric river storms, um, divert water off of the rivers, off of the canals, onto my field. Uh, and so they're taking a chance. Uh, and they're trying to figure out, you know, how long, at what depth, can certain fields be flooded and not impact production, right? So there's a lot of experiment uh, going on now. Um, and then we could you know, have it to pump out during the summer when it's needed. Um, as I mentioned, you know, less is being stored as snow. We can't rely on that snowpack slowly melting and coming down anymore. Um, we need to capture that, those warm storms, which we got something like <laughs> 13 of them or something this year, uh, one after the other after the other. Uh, about 98% of that water went into the Pacific Ocean. 
We need a way to capture more of that. Not all of that. We have deltas, right? We need freshwater flushes, um, but we need a way to capture more of that. Um, you know, it can increase water use efficiency, or uh, wa yeah, water use efficiency, which has been done in a lot of places, but there is still, you know, flood irrigation happening in some places. And then, you know, smart land use planning. So, uh, you know, use crops um, that maybe take less water. Uh, maybe not permanent crops, right? Permanent crops, uh, you know, harden demand. There's no flexibility for permanent crops. Um, when there's drought, you can't just fallow the land. Um, and so, um, so all of these things um, really need to be done in California to, to come into the sustainable use of groundwater and arrest the land subsidence that's uh, absolutely wreaking havoc uh, on infrastructure. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, Michelle, yeah, as usual, right? Very great, very great presentation, very clear to Thank everyone, you. really. Thank you. Enjoy to listen to you. Yeah, questions. Let's start with the lady first, and then we... Thank you. Uh, yeah, I really liked it as well. I was wondering, you made a comment on the learning capacity of the US government, and uh, how do you see the... Uh, the way forward and this learning and co-creation process and what kind of role do you see for us as scientists in that process? Yeah, so I, communication is key. Um, it takes a long time to build relationships uh, with water agencies uh, to gain trust. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I think it's really a communication issue. Uh, the more we talk, the more we show them, the, the, the easier we make things to understand. We can't use jargon. We have to really meet them where they are uh, in their knowledge and help them understand, you know, pictures, uh, simple graphs. Um, we have to keep it simple because otherwise their eyes just glaze over and they don't understand and they move on to some other problem. Yeah, I'll stay with the jargon. Uh, uh, I'm, You're in a safe place. I noticed uh, that um, the the whole area is punctured with uh, so many uh, wells. So how confined in your models is the confined aquifer? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. Um, you know, it really depends on where you are, uh, and we still model it as as confined. Um, and and in, in a lot of places, you really don't see, you know, I mean, you see a similar, uh, you know, water level pattern in the shallow system as the deep, but they, they're still pretty distinct. You know, the one graph I showed, you know, those are in the, the same location. Those are, um, those wells are 20 feet apart. Uh, yeah, about that. And, uh, and so um, it, it's more, it's more confined than I would think um, that you just don't see um, sort of the same patterns happening in the shallow uh, and the deeper systems. So it's, uh, and, and the Corcoran clay, as we've learned too, um, you know, people used to think of it as this like impenetrable, you know, massive clay. And it's really, not, there's a lot of sand stringers in there. Um, so I think there's even communication through that. And, and that's been, you know, uh, geologically, you know, historically true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle, for your great presentation. I, I was wondering how, how the recharge model is working with these flooding ponds in the surface. And because you have Gosh. the most of the formation beneath, uh, I mean, yeah. I think 300 meters depth, yeah. I think. So this water that is stored in the surface has to to travel a long way to go in there. Yeah, fabulous question, uh, Dora, fabulous question. So, um, yeah, it, it can't, you can't use recharge ponds everywhere. They just won't work. So there's a couple of things. First of all, they're going to start using, uh, they've already started using that unconfined, that shallower system as a managed aquifer, um, as a managed reservoir. So it's, it's less, you know, the water quality isn't as good, 
but some crops can take it. And so they've figured out pistachios can, um, can take that reduced water quality, whereas almonds need um, more pristine water. So that's one thing that's happening. I mean, you even see agreements between you know, farmers, neighbor farmers, and say, hey, you have pistachios, let's, let's, um, you use my, my shallow well, we'll do a pipeline, uh, and so that'll reduce subsidence uh, you know, while I can still take from the deep system. So that's one thing that's happening. They're going to start using that shallow system more. The other thing is there's geological mapping now to figure out where are the places that will be most effective for, um, for um, recharge ponds. Because uh, the Corcoran clay is huge, but it's not everywhere. Uh, and so there are places that, um, you know, especially uh, towards the Sierra Nevada mountains, that uh, we can use to get the water under into the system that we need it most. Great question. You're going <clears> to <throat> make us late, Pietro. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Michelle, a great talk as always. So uh, for this study area, you st many people studied for many decades. You know this study very well, ground truth data, underground throughout geology. So my question is very simple. Have you or somebody built a model that can understand or predict uh, to model the deformation or in the past and uh, can sort of like predict the future? Yeah, so the Central Valley hydrologic model has that capability and we've mostly um, used it for um, matching historical data, uh, but we are using it for sort of future scenarios uh, to figure out. You know, it's it's an extremely complicated system. Um, you know, so so to go along with that model. So in California, you don't have to report how much groundwater you're pumping. It's the biggest use of of water, right? And so we have to back out how much groundwater pumping is occurring. So so. There's, you know, likely a lot of error in the model, and, and not only that, but these these uh, these canals that snake through have all of these diversions, and where do those diversions go? I mean, so so trying to figure that out, and then, you know, okay, what crop are they growing? At what stage? How much water would that use? Under what conditions? Uh, it's extremely complicated, uh, and so um, you know, we've really focused on history matching. Um, to make sure that the model has some sort of reality check. Uh, but I'm really excited about these magnetic extensometers that are going to better show us the intervals in which compaction is occurring. It's going to be a modeler's nightmare, I think, uh, to have all of that data. Uh, but I think we really need it so that they can do some targeted, you know, targeted mitigation to figure out where they can pump from and minimize subsidence uh, as, one of the, you know, as one of their metrics that they have to abide by by this law. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michelle, again. <laughs> yeah. Lucky you, Michelle. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, Michelle, thank you very much. Also, on behalf of the scientific committee, so we have the special collector's item here for right, you. Cool. Awesome. First oh thing. God, that is heavy. And we know you <laughs> love the strobe wafers, but unfortunately, uh, we also left them, so we ate them all. Oh. So we only have the box. I'm so sorry. Okay. It's all right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.